a shark because it would only the, I mean the shark couldn't even fight on land. So a shark. Well, I mean that's not how it works. I mean they they're legitimately fighting against each other. You're asking too much. I'm not asking too much. You're asking me to not do the thing that is the thing I do, which is nuance. Well, just answer the question. Shark versus lion, who wins? It would only make sense for them to have a fight in water where a shark would win decisively. Well, I mean, obviously, they're in a little area that they they both are kind of on equal footing, obviously. How can they be on equal footing? You, you don't get it. They can't be on equal footing. I feel like I get it. I feel like I've gotten it since I was three, and I looked at a book, and it had sharks in it. It's very clear. You put them together, one of them dies. Which one dies, which one lives? That's the. It's a wait, wait, wait. Because they're fighting, or because of where you put them? Because they're fighting. Okay. Well, if they're in a fight, they're presumably in the water. So I'm, I'm going with the shark. Shark wins. There, two word answer. Shark wins. Okay. There, I like that. What kind of shark? I'm going with lion. Actually, I, I'm going that a lion would win every time. You were gonna pick whatever I didn't pick. No, that's not true at all. I've always thought lion, and, and the reason is because the lion has teeth that are pointy. It also has claws that are pointy. It has more pointy things, and it can outmaneuver the shark. So by that logic, I guess like a 16-point buck or a moose has a lot of pointy things if you count cloven hooves, so then they would defeat everything? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Most pointies equals win? <laughs> so so this was a question that my buddy George, you know George. George. I know and like George. Yeah, he came up with this for a skit a long time ago. He had this little comedy skit show he did on YouTube called Joe and Buzz. And okay. it has one of the most brilliant openings of any YouTube video I've seen. The, the video is called Joe and Buzz, Shark vs. Lion, and this is how it starts. You ready? I'm ready. Here we go. I think I have to go with the shark. I would have to go with the lion. Really? What are y'all talking about? Shark versus lion cage match. Who do you take? Well, is the cage in the water or out of the water? Obviously, the cage is in the water, but there's a little island in the middle of it. Not so obvious, but yeah, I'll, I'll go with you. I'll take the shark. Why? This is my gut. Wrong. No gut. That's not how you play shark versus lion. If you want to weigh in on shark versus lion, that's fine, okay? But it's not the time for women's intuition. You need logic and reason. That's what we're looking for in this uh, discussion. But a shark and a lion would never logically fight each other. You put a cage around a lion on a little island in a water tank with a shark in it, I think it's a logical conclusion that you will have a fight on your hands. But why would anyone ever do that? Hello? So they would know who would win between a lion and a shark. Yeah, you, you, do you have another way of getting a lion and a shark to fight each other? <laughs> Why do we want him to fight in the first place? Because it would be awesome. You can't see that, can you? Can you not see that a lion fighting a shark would be awesome? How are you not getting this? Can you imagine going through your life not realizing the awesomeness of things? No, I cannot imagine that. You know what that's called? <laughs> Think girl. So, I have thought about that one skit on the internet more than anything I've ever watched on the entire internet. Shark versus lion. Oh, come on. Dude. It was good, but more than anything. I have thought. That where he, We're just going to argue for this entire episode, aren't we? Where he says, hello, how can you not see that a lion <laughs> fighting a shark would be awesome? <laughs> you can't that see that, can you? <laughs> it did. And then, like, the way the, the way the whole thing starts where he just says, I would have to go with the shark, or I would have to go with the lion. You know, it's just like, it's it's such a great, such a great skit. I'm so proud of George. When he made that, when he made that, I called him and I was like, "I like you. Can can we?" I did kind of the thing with George that I did with you, and it was after seeing Shark versus Lion because it's amazing. Well, I'm really grateful because that bought me a six hour conversation with George the other day while he was probably needing to be getting work done, but instead we talked about every existential issue regarding humankind and the life of the mind that we could think of. That's the thing, man. You just want to talk about nuance, and you don't want to come down to it and say. Yay, verily, a shark's going to win. I had to I had to hold you down and get you in a chokehold to make you make a decision. You could not get me in a chokehold. <laughs> no, you didn't. That's not how the things... The question is patently terrible, and that is the point of the, the dull skit, is that it's an awful question that makes no sense and requires nuance. What kind of shark? How old is the lion? These are important things. And obviously, where are they going to fight? <laughs> you put them in a little cage right there on, a, on an island. Obviously. <laughs> 
it, it, it it's in a cage with an island with some water around it. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. I don't, I don't know why you're not getting this. I think animals are fascinating, and particularly the fact that tooth and nail are given to these animals in the animal kingdom, and their charter is to survive. Yeah. And a lot of times that pits them against each other. Their charter is to survive. That was downright warrior poet, buddy. Nicely done. I don't know. I just made it up. What do you think the biggest animal you could take would be? Like you. Oh. Ooh. Biggest or dangerousest? I don't care, man. Look, why, why can't you just answer a question, Matt? Okay. It's just a simple it's, question. It's, it's a child they, they, could understand what I just said. It's not a simple said. question. It is. Have you ever been asked that question? Yeah, totally. What's the biggest animal you think you could take? I think I could take down, like, somewhere between puma and lion. No, you have no chance against a lion. You would be gutted and eaten. That's what I'm they saying. They would peer up out of your corpse with that blood mouth look that they do on the nature channels. Yeah. And everyone who loves you would be deeply saddened. You have no chance against a lion. Exactly. Mountain lion, I think you got a chance. Exactly. So th- there is a continuum there between you know lion, puma-ish mm-hmm. to lion. Somewhere in there, I could take them. But immediately after that threshold, they could take me. I just know my limits, man. I have encountered mountain lions in the wild, both a pretty big male and some more modest females. And the male, I would say, was about really close to my size. But I don't have any pointy things at all. I have like a couple of slightly ground down incisors, and that's it. I mean, I just have my monkey thumbs that are good for using tools and stuff. I think, I mean, they say fight back against a mountain lion, right? So when you asked me the question, my first thought was mountain lion, and that's why I was like, oh, dangerousest or biggest. Because biggest, I don't know. I mean, how do you take down an animal? I guess the game plan's not like punch it to death. You, you'd have to go for a chokehold, right? Um, yeah, I think so. I think that you choke it out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, in Texas the other day, this is not an exaggeration. This actually happened. No, no, forgive me. New Hampshire. A New Hampshire guy killed a coyote with his bare hands. I'm reading directly off of the news article. All right. New Hampshire man killed a coyote with his bare hands after it attacked his two year old on Monday morning. I mean, all right. This dude was this dude was hiking. And he's out with his kid, and all of a sudden this coyote comes out of nowhere, grabs his son, and starts dragging his son off. Okay. And the dude just went ballistic. Like, he he just, like, went into some kind of rage mode, and he just grabbed this coyote, which was biting him and stuff, and he just choked the thing out. He killed the thing out. I mean, just did it right there. I'm going to suck the life out of your body. Yeah, but, I mean, that's a coyote. Coyote's like Maya. I like my chances against Maya. Yeah? I mean, I'm okay, well, that was the wrong response. Great dadding. Your kid got attacked. The thing that you run the scenarios about in your brain before you go to sleep at night about what you would do if your family was in danger. He clearly had run the scenario. He knew what to do. He saved his kid. That is awesome. And the world has plenty of coyotes. Everybody's fine here. That's awesome. That said, come on. I mean, it's a coyote. I would hope every person on earth over the age of 13 and under the age of very, very old could handle their business against a coyote. Have you seen one of those? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're pretty small. What about a wolf, though? A wolf's, a wolf's a bigger thing to tussle with. Oh, that's a different thing. You ever seen one of those in the wild? No, I haven't. I, I've heard you talk about it, and from what, I, from what I hear from you and other people, it's just it's nothing like the coyotes I'm used to seeing. You just don't get it until you're standing there. It is crazy. I've seen maybe a dozen independent wolf sightings, some of those packs, some of those individuals, but there was one. Can I tell you my wolf story? Yeah. Okay. There was one where I was driving the family back down from this old gold mining town. It's called Atlantic City. It's near Lander. And we're coming down the drive and I'm kind of spotting for wildlife, you know, keeping one eye on the road, one eye on the animal situation. And sure enough, down in this gulch, I can see what looks like a great big silver dog. I'm like, that's got to be a wolf. I'd been hearing people say that some lone wolves and maybe a little pack had kind of moved down into that part of the mountains. And I thought, well, I I saw one. I want to go look. And knowing, armed with some Google information, that they never, ever, ever, ever attack humans. I mean, it is the freakest of freak situations that a wolf will attack a human. I thought, I'm going to go check this thing out. Dude. Family's in the car. I just walk down the hillside, and there's kind of a little trout stream between me and the animal. 
and it was really interested in something in in a little sagebrush or something, and it was kind of pawing at it. So I had the right relationship with the wind to it. I had the advantage. There was a decent amount of wind noise and stuff, so I don't know, it just wasn't paying attention to me. And there's a, a little maybe barbed wire fence between us and this little stream. And the closer I got, the more I thought, that's insane. You you don't see dogs like this. And then I got close enough, I could see its mitts. And they were huge. They were like, if I spread out my hand as wide as I can, they were that kind of big. And I do not have huge hands, but I can palm like a basketball a, with my left hand. I can't with my right. Like a catcher's mitt? Yeah, like a little old school catcher's mitt. Like, it was incredible. And it still didn't make me, and it still didn't make me. And I thought, there, there's no way this animal, given its body language and posture, is just going to turn and snarl at me and attack me. Like, this is fine. And so I got down closer, and I just went, <whistles> just like I'd call my dog, right? Yeah cute little whistle. And I mean, the first puff of air crossed my lips and that dog's ears went up like Optimus Prime antenna and it just whipped. I mean, it triangulated me in an instant, like lightning. And it did the thing like you see in all the the wolf TV shows and movies where you get a look at all the teeth. Yeah. And this terror just shot through my body. Oh, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? <laughs> and I, so. and I, I literally put my hands up as though the dog would like want to know where my hands are. Do I have a weapon? Like, let's show him the hands. And I just started to kind of carefully back away. And it's doing the thing where it kind of stretched out its front paws a little bit to the side to get a little wider, quicker stance. And I just thought, uh... uh Okay, you, you, like you're bigger than me. I didn't expect that until I got close. And it kind of moved away, but keeping an eye on me the whole way. And then finally it turned and bolted up the hillside, you know, I don't know, 50 feet or whatever. And then it turned and looked again. And I thought, I wonder if I whistle again, if it'll keep looking. And so I'd let it go 20 more feet and I'd whistle. And it would do the same thing and the same thing and the same thing. And finally it went up and over the hill. And uh, I kind of backed away as well. And I, I just could not believe how big an animal that was when I actually got up close. You would never mistake a true wolf for a true coyote, ever. So, so where were you at on the scale? Were you like, if this comes to it, I can I can take it? Absolutely. There's no way that dog would have beaten me. Really? There's only one thing it could do. Bite. The paws are going to be a problem, but that mouth on my neck, is that's the only thing I really have to defense, you know? Yeah, but what about the bear? So you 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 thumped a bear in the head or something with a fishing rod one. We talked about that on the podcast. So when you yeah, real early on when you were encountering the bear, where where were you at? Were you like I'm dead? If it wants me to be dead, I'm dead. Yes, it wasn't that big a bear. It was big. I initially mistook it for a cow in the twilight as we were coming out of the water. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it looked so cute on the one hand, but it was just big and it was agile. And that's what I remember about the bear is being up that close to it, just seeing how smooth its movements were and thinking like, you know, when you're watching an old athlete kind of limp down the court, but they're still, you know, they're savvy yeah, and they can compete because of what they know versus the 20 year old that you're like, oh my goodness, that's right. That's how 20 year old athletes move. Right. No damage on that. No miles on those tires. Dang. That's what the bear was like. It was like a, a big defensive lineman in football, except really nimble and agile and loose and fluid. And that made me think I might not win that one. Mm. This was a black bear. I've run into grizzly bears in the wild at a little healthier distance, and I'd just be dead. I'd try to trick it into thinking I'm dead. I'd have, I'd have no chance. Dang. You ever had like a this animal's freaking me out kind of encounter? No, I, I think around here... I mean, humans, well, I guess gators are the closest. Yeah, I guess I have with a gator. So I actually got a gun law changed because of an encounter I had with gators one time. So, Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was out on the kayak, had my daughter. She was five or less. And I had my, my pistol on my hip, 357 Magnum. We got out in the water. And, you know, I was like, well, you know, I'm, I know I'm not supposed to have a gun here because this is a, a wildlife refuge. But, you know, this is... I, I hear there's gators out here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna carry my pistol, and I did. And my thought was, if if one gets in the boat with me, I'll just off it, right? And I have to do a headshot. I've I've always been told they have real small brains, so you got to hit them in the right spot. But you know, I've never had a desire to kill an an alligator. And we get out there in the water, and all of a sudden, I see this gator on the bank. That's insane. I mean, we're we're 
pretty dang far away. And when it sees me pass, and we're probably about 100 yards from where we put in, it just kind of slowly walks down the bank, probably, yeah, five or six feet, I'd say, just kind of slinks into the water and goes submerged. And I was like, all right, the game is on. <laughs> so here we go. And so I, I took the pistol off my hip, and I just laid it in my lap, had it on ready. It's a revolver, so it's ready to go. And I just did a 180 and went right back and took my kayak out of the water. <laughs> How big was the animal? It was like five, six feet long, but... I wasn't concerned for me. I thought if I get down, it'll do the death roll thing, you know? Yeah, you know, the death roll, casual death roll. But I was more concerned with my daughter. My daughter was like a little chicken nugget to that thing. Yeah. And and, and that's actually, you know, my youngest daughter, I've been very concerned about um, coyotes just wandering around neighborhoods. I've been concerned that in the wintertime when they get hungry or something, she's just like a little snack. And um, Yeah, there's not much, there's not much to that sweet little thing. No, no, not at all. And so it's it's really, I mean, it's really scary to me. And and so I mean, I I feel that protective, you know, man man cub kind of thing going on. I gotta I gotta take care of her. So I don't know. I, I may or may not have a plan to off every animal within a hundred yards of the house. Because <laughs> that's what dads do. We that's think what, like, we think of how to protect our family, our little tribe from the forces of nature that want to kill it. Have you ever had a tussle with a wild animal or like a straight up confrontation? Oh man, I don't think I had no, nothing that was concerning. No, I mean, what, there's a there's a story about my dog that I'm not going to tell you. It's the saddest story that's ever happened to me. It's long story short, I killed my own dog on accident. Um, what? It, How, it's, oh, you can't say that and not tell me the story. Now you sound like a monster, dude. No, this is. I mean, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that Are I'm going to ball. Are you crying? No, I'm not. I I might. So Okay, we're going to Are we seriously going to do this? What? Dude, you just teased us. You can't All right. Okay, doing. here we go. We're doing it. Okay, so a long time ago, um I worked on a system to protect vehicles from rockets, and I'll be a little cagey about all this, but the the ultimate test involved me driving the vehicle, which was a Striker, which is an eight-wheel drive vehicle. And uh, driving it under a wire, under a rope, and shooting a rocket down that rope. And so, if you can imagine, I would I would hop in this thing, I would go under armor, and I would drive, and you know, three, two, one, and I I had I had everything rigged up where, you know, I did all the math where when I'm in a certain position, it would it would fire at me and stuff like that. And so I'm literally driving an armored vehicle and shooting rockets at myself. Oh my goodness. Okay. And then just doing things with data and stuff like that. Won't get into Sometimes all Sometimes at, at my old job, I would help people when they were sad about things in their lives. Yeah. So it's like that. So so that that would be a useful trait or a useful ability here in a second. So Okay. So I had I had this dog named Ellie May and I took Ellie May with me to work at the rocket range all the time. Ellie May was the best. And so she could speak English, so I could tell her exactly what I wanted her to do. Ellie Mae, go get me a squirrel. She'd go find a squirrel, tree it. Ellie Mae, go get in the truck. She'd go literally jump in my truck. If the window's open, she'd jump in, whatever. Ellie Mae, sit right here. Be right back. She'd sit by my desk. And so I took her to work. Everybody knew Ellie Mae. And so I, I get in the armored, ve- armored vehicle, and I'm waiting on a countdown for a rocket. And I say, Ellie Mae, go, go sit by that tree over there. And she would literally go over there and sit by the tree. And then I got in the armored vehicle, buttoned it up, and um, I got ready to go. I'm doing my countdown, got my checklist, all this stuff. Just imagine getting ready for a major event involving pyrotechnics firing at you. Just imagine the types of checklists you have. And okay. And I and I look through the vision block. You're driving through prisms. You're not driving with your eyes or windshields. You're driving through vision blocks. And I look through the vision block, and Ellie Mae's not by the tree. And you know where this is going. You know, oh. three, two, one, go. I take off. I have to hit a certain speed a certain amount of time in order for all the math to work. And as soon as I take off, I feel four bumps on the left side of the vehicle. Bump, 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 oh. bump. And I was like, no, 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 no. That That's not what I think. No. And so I was like, dang it. And so I'm just like saying bad things in my head. And then I I do the run. I I hit all the hit all the velocities, hit all the points, get all the data, 
And then um, I, I get on the radio and I was like, hey, uh, save, save all the systems. I got to go do something. And so I drive the thing, drive the armored vehicle back to back to the, the, the starting point. And sure enough, I had hit Ellie Mae. Her oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you made me do this. <laughs> so, oh, no, yeah. you made you do this. You can't half tell a story like that. Yeah. But this isn't about who made who do what. I am so sorry. Yeah. So uh, broke her hips um, and, and busted her, her, her gut. And so I'm looking at oh. her. And, and this is, I was, so she's not dead. She's alive. And like, I love Ellie Mae. Probably best dog I've ever had. And so I'm sitting there and... I'm I'm looking at her laying there, and I was like, "Well, okay, I everything's off. I know this is an active missile range right now. I'm putting this dog in a truck. I'm going to the nearest vet. Woodrow, what's the nearest vet? Woodrow goes, "Man, we can go to blah blah blah." And he tells me, and I was like, "There's not room. How do we do this? She's bleeding." He's like, "Throw her in the back." So I I, I go to grab her to throw her in the back, and she's in fight or flight, right? Yeah. So she bites me on the hand, not like little bites me. She's like, "I'm dying." Everything's trying to kill me. I have to kill everything that's trying to kill me. Yeah. So she bites me on the hand, and I was like, "Dang it!" And 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 she latches on. And I I pull her off, and I look at my hand. I'm I'm bleeding. I was like, "Golly!" And I and I try to get a, another angle at her, go a different way, and she gets me again. Bit through my bit my fingernail off. Oh. And I was like, "Oh, it was, it was legit, man. It was awesome." And so, long story short, um, we used a floor mat, covered her face. Got her in the back of the truck, speeding down a missile range. Get to a, uh, get to a place, and um, get to the the vet. And I'm like, "Hey, I don't have a lot of money, but fix her, whatever." Because the guy's like, you know, oh, this would take a lot of money because you know her hips are broken. This would take a lot of money to fix her. I mean, I you know we're talking surgery, and I can't guarantee anything. And I said, I don't care what it costs, do it. And he's like, well, I mean, I don't think you understand. You know, we're not really sure if her back's broken. I was like, did you hear me? Do it. I don't care. Do it. It doesn't matter what it, what it costs. And the vet kind of looks at Woodrow, who's an old Army vet. And, and Woodrow looks at me. He's a hard man, very hard man. And he looks at me, and he goes, Destin, what, Woodrow? He said, uh, son, the right thing to do is to put your dog down. I was like, I don't want to do that, Woodrow. He's like... Come here, bud. And he gives me a big old hug. Oh. Just, just a big old hug. Like you were talking about a hard man. And uh gives me a big Dogs hug. Make us soft. And he and he just and he just sits there for a minute. And I just said, Yes, sir. And then uh I said, Okay, do it. And then they put her down. And then I <laughs> it was so weird because afterwards I went back to the range and I was bleeding all over. I, I had blood everywhere. It was my blood. It was Ellie Mae's blood. It was just like, I looked like I had been destroyed. And um, and then we went to the hospital, and they tried to sew my fingernail back on. (laughs) The end. (laughs) How old were you? This I I was an engineer. I was an adult. I was uh, probably 20. I understand that. 25? Yeah. Yeah. I, I got home. I cried so dang hard. It was wild. It was wild. Yeah, making a mistake like that is rough. Oh, I'm sorry. But in the context of this conversation, we can totally cut all that discussion out. Nope. Have I ever told you that story? I knew that you had a dog named Ellie Mae. I knew that you loved her, and I knew that something happened, but I don't recall those details. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty wild. I lost a dog when I was 24 that I loved, and I know you're trying to pivot, and I'm going to let you, but... His name was Brosnan. He was all black, and he had a little white spot, like a little bow tie, like James Bond, Goldeneye James Bond. And sweet dog, great dog. I mean, goofy dog, but I, I, I love Brosnan. And we lived out in the country, and he had a dog across the street named Coral, who he liked, beautiful German Shepherd, and they would go and goof around and stuff. And got a call one day at work, and the the dog got hit. They were crossing the road together, and... I think the other one escaped getting hit, but Brosnan got hit. Uh, well, the information I got said nobody stopped or anything. And so, um, so it was pouring rain that day in northern Colorado. I came home because I was preoccupied, had to, had just had to see if maybe somehow the dog was okay. And so I went up and down the ditches. It was like, you know, late spring, so it's squishy and filthy and 
pouring rain. And finally, you know, I, I see Brosnan down there and I kind of slide down into the muddy ditch. There's a little bit of water running and it's like, a, well, he wouldn't be laying there like that in those conditions if he was okay. And sure enough, um, he was gone and it took me, it took me long enough to find him that, you know, he'd already, it's kind Rig-a- of gross. Rigor mortified? It, yes. It was very <laughs> difficult to pick yeah. him up. Yeah. And so we didn't have any money. We're kids. I can't pay it. Can we agree that it's harder to bury a dog once it's rigor mortified than if it's not? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, there's, I guess there's a so. certain I logistics mean, I, that goes into burying your dogs. There's a place I like to bury my dogs. There's a certain logistics to how to move the dog, man. I know there because, is. So what do I, you do? So I find Brosnan. I have to. I have to bring him back to our house, and it's a, like a quarter uh, mile. I hate that we're and talking so, about this. I hate this. And so, I hate everything just, about this episode. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm not. Cr- I'm not crying. That's laughing. We'll make That's it laughing. better. Oh god! I had. I couldn't look at my dog, right? But I also wasn't going to leave my dog in that ditch anymore. And so I had a, a, like a bag. And so I put the bag over my dog's face. And then all I could do was just pick him up and walk down the road with my dog with my dog in the rain. And I just bawled the yeah. whole way, man. And so I say all of that just to say, I feel you, man. I'm really sorry. That That's a bigger deal than somebody who's never had and loved a dog could understand. Do you know what's interesting? You're trying to pivot. You may pivot. This is not what we were trying to do here. No, not at all. No. Nope. But but that that wolf that you saw in the wild, mm-hmm. when you whistled at that wolf and its ears perked up and it looked at you and showed it showed you its teeth. Mm-hmm. However many many years ago, there was a human at a camp that had killed a woolly mammoth or something like that. Mm-hmm. And and a dog came up and it whistled at that dog, at that wolf. And its ears poked up, and instead of growling, it walked up, and it it, it showed kindness. Mm-hmm. And somehow, we got from the whistle that you made to that wolf, to me and you crying like like little children. Yes, <laughs> we buried. You well know, said there there is yes there is the one there was one moment where a dog turned its affection towards a man, and and vice versa. And then here we are, like the only thing that's. I don't know of anything that has broken me quite like that um, in a really long time. So I, I don't know. It's it's really interesting that we got there. Um, but we're talking about animals fighting. We're not <laughs> – we're talking about animals fighting. Emily Grassley, when we were talking with her, I think the first time we ever talked with her, she used the language of, you know, there's, she was saying there's all these different things to discover and explore and all kinds of additional animals floating around out there, but – all the charismatic ones have been found. And I'd never thought of that language, charismatic. And we do, I mean, we have the capacity to feel affection for these things because they all have some of the same features that we do. It's easy to anthropomorphize them, but nothing like a dog. Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting dogs that you bring are up... remarkable that way. Oh, yeah. Dogs are awesome. It's interesting that you bring up Emily Grassley. She's at the Field Museum there in Chicago. Um, one of the stories I was going to tell you about as we were talking about shark versus lion is Carl Akeley, who was a, a taxidermist. He was a biologist. He worked there at the uh, Field yes. Museum back in the day. You've heard the name, I'm sure. Yes, it took me a minute to register, but yeah, uh, yes, I have. He killed a leopard with his bare hands on an expedition one time. Wow. Like, there's a picture. There's a, There's an awesome picture of him sitting there in a sling, like a cloth sling with this just gigantic man beard that I'll never be able to grow with this look on his face yeah, like, yep, time. yep, just had to kill a mm. leopard, and they got the leopard sitting there hanging beside him. And he drew a map about how, you know, it stalked him in the water, and, you know, they had a little tussle. It was just amazing. He had a gun at one point, and he, he missed and ended up hand-to-hand combat with this leopard, and he won. He killed it. Wow. What would you do if you went at a leopard right now? Lose. You wouldn't lose. I don't think you would. But what would you... To a leopard? Yeah, I would. The reason he beat the leopard is because he was a naturalist and he was very familiar with its behavior. And the reason that I think I would win against most mountain lions is that I've seen them a lot. I understand their terrain very well. I'm from the same terrain. Leopard is foreign. It's a little bit bigger. It's a little bit stronger. And I don't understand it. And I think the advantage he had over a normal person, in addition to a beard dripping with masculinity, was that I think he understood the animal well enough to know what to do. I really like it when you you 
put in those little anecdotes inside the middle of the story to just boost yourself up about your beard and stuff. That's great. What? I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, do I even have a beard? There's something different though about the game is on. Like here we go. It, it's it's you or me. One of us is going to die right now. That is different. Like like that changes that changes the equation in your head. And th- this guy in New Hampshire that killed this coyote, he said he you know, they were like, well, what are you thinking? He's like, nothing. I was thinking nothing. I went to like some kind of, I don't know, caveman-like place where it's just like, I am going to kill this thing methodically. I'm going to use every bit of advantage I have. My brain, I'm going to outmaneuver. I'm going to stick a thumb in its eye. I'm going to pocket sand this creature. You know, I'm going to do whatever I have to do yep. to destroy yep. this other being. And And that's what I'm talking about. When I'm saying... You pit these animals against each other. Like, you've seen these Japanese hornets. Have you seen these things and what they do to a beehive? The, the bees, one of the countermeasures they have is they will, they will all swarm the hornet, and, and they'll, they'll just try to, like, heat it up to death. I, am I making this up? I think that's a thing. Yeah, here's a video on YouTube. 30 Japanese giant hornets kill 30,000 honeybees. But, <sighs> but, like, what do you do? I mean, these things are here. Well, and one of those helps things, and one of those I think we've determined is completely useless. What's that? I mean, does a hornet do anything? Oh, yeah. Does it contribute anything? <laughs> <laughs> one, could, one could argue that you and I don't contribute much. <laughs> so however you think animals came to be, I don't care for the purpose of this discussion. Once they have that weapon, it's like, this is my thing, and this is what I'm going to go to. A boa constrictor, what's it going to do? It's it's going to... Uh, put, yeah, it's going to strike and coil. It's going to try to put the forever sleep on you, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, what, what? every one of these animals have a special finishing move. <laughs> and, like, you're sitting wow, there... Yeah, when you put it like that. You're sitting there at the controller. You're hitting those buttons as fast as you can. You're always going sonic boom if you have guile. You're always going spin side kick or whatever it is if you're fighting with Chun Li, right? I feel like I would beat you at Street Fighter a lot, but yes, I understand in principle what you mean. It's possible, whatever. So, I don't know. Like, what are some what are some finishing moves of animals that you you particularly like? Oh, wow. Well, I mentioned one earlier. The dog wears you down to get to the throat. Yeah. Uh, it's got this perfectly shaped muzzle to get in between the gap between a chin and a, a, thor- a chest cavity to make that one horrifying ripping move and put somebody down real, real quick if it's bigger. If it's smaller, the dog and the cat have a similar move, but especially the dog will do the bite and snap. Have you seen a dog do that? No. That makes sense, though. Man, it's efficient. I've never thought about the, yeah. the shape of the snout to do that. That's amazing. Part of the hardware, right? Do you know what cordyceps are? Mm, I don't think so. What does that mean? We're, 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 kind of, we're kind of veering outside of you know the animal versus animal thing. Cordyceps are uh, a, a particular type of fungus that will infect a certain type of animal, and it will eat it from the inside out. Like it, it'll, it'll get into an insect and affect its brain. And and it well no let me, let me I'm I'm confusing two things. There's a bacteria does that does that. There's a cordycep which will get inside of an animal and basically eat it from the inside out. There's Ugh. another there's another crazy type of bacteria that will infect an ant's brain, and then make the ant climb up to the top of a leaf. It, it, it'll literally take over the the ant's brain and control it. Okay. And and make it climb to the top of a leaf. For some reason, that's all it wants to do to be eaten by a bird, which is where the you know the younglings of of this bacteria live. I mean, there there's some like crazy finishing moves. <laughs> that's like the bird box bacteria. That yeah. whatever the thing was in the bird box, that's what it did to people. It made them just make horrible decisions for their own well being. Yeah, exactly. That's freaky. Yeah, cordyceps are crazy though. When you're in the Amazon rainforest, you can just walk around with a flashlight at night. And you can find these bugs that are like on a stick, and they look like a normal bug, but they look like they've got grass growing out of their bodies, like right from the middle of their exoskeleton. Oh. And it's this fungus that just punches straight out. No, I did not know that was a thing. It's crazy. Wow. It's nuts. 
So we're hanging out with my parents right now, and my mom asked me if we wanted to hang out for dinner the other night instead of going out, and you want to guess what she made for us? Um, steak and sass. Please say steak and sass. <laughs> it was not. I haven't seen steak and sass in the rotation for a while. She made the uh, the little crusted Parmesan chicken. Yeah. You, have you had that yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's good. Okay. And obviously, I'm talking about the crusted Parmesan chicken from HelloFresh because... This round of NDQ is sponsored by HelloFresh, which is awesome. I've got a new favorite, actually. I I have a new favorite meal. It's this uh, sausage spaghetti stuff. Okay, I've seen that. I haven't tried it yet. Why is it good? Uh, it's, it's, It's so good to the point where I try to hide it from everyone else. Like, if there's leftovers, I hide them for me. That's how good it is. You know what happened when I... So I've never had HelloFresh. Oh, I got it pulled up right here. It's called Tuscan Sausage and Pepper Spaghetti. Oh, dude. Oh, my goodness. It's the, amazing. The name sounds fancy delicious. Oh, it's incredible, dude. You got to do it. I walked in after mom made dinner. You know, food was all ready to go. I got home, came in. It was like when I was a kid. The house is just filled with HelloFresh. Have you noticed this? It's different when somebody makes HelloFresh than when they make like whatever food because there's always some kind of unique spice and flavoring and it just smells inviting and interesting and awesome. And unsurprisingly, it was interesting and awesome. No doubt. It's... It's great. It's changed the way we do food. We love it. I mean, sometimes if the kids go to bed, I'll make it specifically so I have leftovers. The official line on this is that you can get mouthwatering seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door with HelloFresh. It's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh makes cooking at home fun, easy, and affordable. All of that sound right with your experience? Fun, easy, affordable? Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a very, like, read this off the page way to say it. The way I would say it is it has changed fundamentally the way my family looks at preparing food, the logistics of acquiring the food to bring to the table, and the act of yeah. preparing it. It's fundamentally changed all that because a five-year-old can zest a lime if you put the right tools yeah. in their hands and point to a picture that's on the, the, the HelloFresh card. I mean, it's fundamentally changed the way we do food as a family. So if you go to HelloFresh.com slash NDQ10 and then you use the promo code NDQ10, you get 10 free meals, including free shipping. HelloFresh.com slash NDQ10 fundamentally will change the way your family views, purchases, prepares, and consumes food. It's great. It's like, it's healthy, it's high quality, you're going to love it. So HelloFresh.com slash NDQ10, and use the promo code NDQ10, that gets you 10 free meals, and shipping with HelloFresh. Let me say that again. 10 free meals. That's a lot of food. Yep, it's good. It's flexible. It does change the way you think about stuff. It, everything about it feels like an upgrade. So if you haven't tried it out, give it a go. We cannot express enough how grateful we are to the people at HelloFresh for being a part of what we're doing here at the program. 100% agree. Hey, you and I both know Patrick from Tier Zoo on the YouTubes. Yes, we should we should see if he wants to jump on. He knows this stuff better than either of us. Yeah, he's a biologist, isn't he? I don't. Know, I think so. I mean, he sure seems like it. I mean, he this is what he does for a living. Literally, he thinks about how the animals work and what their finishing moves are and where they rank. It's brilliant. Yeah, let's do it. Give him a call. Right, I'm, I'm just call. Let's pat, I'm calling him. Let's patch him in. Hello. Hey, Patrick. Okay, let me make sure everything's working here. Okay, we got everybody here. Patrick, Destin, Destin, Patrick. Everybody in the room? Yes. Yes, sir. Hey, buddy, we're wading into your territory here. It's getting a little awkward, and we thought we needed to get you on the phone. Destin, you want to bring him up to speed? Yeah, so so I, I guess we need to bring two groups of people up to speed. So, Patrick, this is what we're doing. We're talking about basically animal finishing moves. So we're we're talking about... Animals, when they fight each other, some of them have more power than others, and some of them basically shark versus lion. By the way, what do you take, shark versus lion? Which one wins? You say shark versus lion? Yeah, one word answer. You just have to pick. That's how it works. Uh, shark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Dang it. So so for the third chair, real quick, the reason that was a hard thing for Patrick to do is because he has a YouTube channel called Tear Zoo, and he analyzes in overly great detail i don't know maybe not overly it's just almost adequate detail it's it's wonderful however you want to say it it's amazing he'll take two animals there's two classes of animals and he'll pit them against each other 
or he'll he'll just analyze like how a certain set of animals came to be. It's really great stuff. Well, it's it's gamer language with ranking tiers of classes for all of these different categories. So the one that came out today was about animals in the urban jungle, city animals, yeah, how they rank out and how they work. And it's using all the language that I track with from RPGs and different, uh, just different gaming genres. It's really stinking fun. And for the sake of the third chair, I don't know if any channel that had a better first year than what you put together, Patrick. I mean, it was just amazing. You are killing it. <laughs> Thanks, man. I'm really glad you enjoy it. It's definitely hard to explain the like conceit of the channel. But yeah, normally what I say is it's uh, wildlife ecology and evolution uh, through the lens of gaming. Uh, that was much more concise than my version. <laughs> I can tell you've had to practice that for elevators. And yeah, that. exactly. I mean, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> I, I will say this. So, I, I learned more about gaming culture through your videos than, you know, just reading like gamer forums. I just don't get it. So, for example... <laughs> You, you you say, like, is this specific trait OP? Like you say, right. for example, is is Matt's bald head OP? <laughs> yes, it is. Symmetrical right? perfection, reflectiveness. Can you briefly explain what OP means to me? Uh, so OP just stands for overpowered. So a lot of uh, uh, people who play games competitively or even semi-competitively will a lot of times start accusing other traits or other characters as overpowered so for example if you play super smash bros you might say oh i i really think this character is overpowered maybe i think palutena is overpowered or or mario or something mario? Uh, and then maybe you'll complain about all the reasons why so like odd job yes yeah exactly i think i think a lot of people would say odd job in 007 in goldeneye is overpowered because he's got he's what half the size of your average character so you have to you'd be a better shot to beat him yeah because it's it's hugely advantageous to be diminutive hugely <laughs> and i can just think of all the advantages of that just right here i'm, I'm prepared to list them off we Absolutely. that could be another episode <laughs> nobody knows that about you matt <laughs> <laughs> we, we were just talking about different types of animals that would go against each other what do you think the biggest animal you could take with your bare hands like all of a sudden, like you, you spawn in a game, and it's naked Patrick versus the world, and all the animals start coming at you one after the other. Like, what is the biggest tier you get to before they take you? Oh gosh. Okay, I think I'm gonna go with a deer. What? I think that's probably the biggest I could go with, but it's still not. It'd be tough for it to kill me that quickly. Like, I definitely couldn't take like a lion or anything of similar size, but a deer is about. Could be about that size, or a big one. And I think, I mean, it'd be pretty. It'd be pretty ugly. I'd be messed up. <laughs> you got to watch out for those front hooves as well as the the rack. Exactly. I've seen quite a few videos on YouTube of of hunters getting like pummeled by deer, mm -hmm. just pelted with the the hooves and stuff. And they're usually like okay, but. <laughs> By the end of it, they're just on the ground cowering. Yeah, I think I'd like to change my answer to that question, given mm -hmm. what I just heard you say, Patrick. Uh, I went with uh, Mountain Lion. I Oof. think I'd like to change that to know. Manatee. Manatee, okay. I think I, could, I think I could defeat a manatee, and they're very large. No. But uh, no, they just don't have the hardware to, to take care of me, and I, I don't know. I, I think I have a chance. There's no way, well, man. How would you would, kill it? I don't know, maybe like uh, two fists in its mouth real far, so it's super hard for it to function. <laughs> it gets disoriented, <laughs> maybe gets upside down, get that thing to shore. I don't know. I'm sorry I said it. The more I think about it, the more I think I guess I would just be eaten by a manatee. I, I, I guess I'm going to go with a draw with the manatee. Okay. So like in, in that fight, does the manatee start on land or do you start in the water? Or how does oh, that I'm work? I'm winning if it's on land. If, if that's on land, I'm doing pro wrestling moves. On I, I totally agree. But if it's in the moves, water, yeah. do you think you have a chance? I mean, similar to how you asked about the lion and the shark. I, I feel like the terrain there is everything. No, no, it's not. I mean, obviously, like, like my buddy George on his skit in, uh, there's a YouTube video called Shark vs. Lion. It's by Joe and Buzz. You need to watch it. And uh, he, he basically says, obviously, it's it's a cage with an island with water around it. I mean, clearly, that's where they're fighting. I don't even know why you're even asking this, Patrick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess that's settled. <laughs> don't we feel dumb? <laughs> I'm just, gotcha.
that's that's the tone of the video. It's excellent. You'll you'll enjoy it. Have you ever encountered a moose in the wild, Patrick? I have seen a moose in uh, Glacier National Park in Montana. Oh yeah, those are legit mooses up there too. Yeah, I would not want to get too close to one of those. But I've never had like a close call with one or anything. Yeah, Destin and I earlier were talking about like actual confrontations with animals. And we got sidetracked, but that's the biggest animal I've ever had a confrontation with. I was in Colorado and there was a little mooselet walking around. I was like, oh, that's adorable. Oh, no. <laughs> and it was still pretty wobbly and everything. And the reason it was wobbly is because it had just been born. Right. And mom was uh, recovering from giving birth. It was very recent. Okay. And I, know, I, was like, I was a kid, not a kid. I was like 19. So I just, was an idiot. And I was like, there's a baby moose. I want to go check that out. And then up out of the rushes in the marsh comes this just angry monster with this weird beard. And hey, what the heck is that thing? And it's it's all over me. And there were and all I could do was keep a tree between me and it until it got bored. And I had to dance for a long time. I didn't feel like I could make a break for it. And in that moment, I thought, these are not cuddly. This will murder me if I don't continue to do this childlike. You can't get around the table faster than I can run around the table game that I learned by practicing on my brother and sister. Those things are not pleasant. So I agree with your assessment on the deer, but I think you upgrade that one spot and you're right. Yeah, we're, we're outmatched. Oh, for sure. I, those things will absolutely kill you. Oh, I was going to say, I remember reading Gary Paulson as a kid. He wrote a few different books. One of them, I think his most famous one is The Hatch, is Hatchet. But he wrote a lot of uh, stories about his personal life and how the worst thing you'd want to encounter in the wild is... A mother moose because they will just trample you and trample you for days and if you even look like you're still alive they'll keep trampling you so that's really smart that you kept the tree in, uh, in between you that's really clever oh i've seen that happen that happened to my poodle man i told you this right destin are we gonna kill another dog today man we no we're not no we're not we're not we're not okay. only okay. two um maybe maybe this one a little bit my parents were in Colorado, same place I saw the moose. They let the poodle out of the cabin to go down and, you know, do its little poodle pee-pee thing early in the morning. And a moose came out of the willows. And they had this beautiful little moment of encounter, like nose to nose. And my parents were like, oh, Susan, come look at this. This is amazing. And then the moose just <laughs> reared up and started mashing my poodle. With no. A oh. <laughs> but, and it was squishy mud. And so it was just stomping my poodle into the mud. And so okay. then mom and dad are like, well, let's go get the poodle. And so they got into the Corolla and they backed down the cabin driveway and the moose kind of backed off. And they found they found this toy poodle just entombed <laughs> in mud. And they, oh they got her out and like, like her face is all like sideways a spatula. and stuff. <laughs> yes. I mean, it was like the kind of like a children's Warner Brothers joke. But no, they, they got the dog out and she was pretty banged up. They got a little work done on her and uh, and she bounced back. I mean, her face was weird after that, but she survived the moose encounter. So wow, that's apparently incredible. Apparently, my poodle can do something you and I could not. Apparently. Well, I mean, it didn't kill the moose, so call it a draw, There's maybe. There's something funny about when you when call you take two animals that are... So if animals are in a similar class and they're fighting, it's amazing. If animals are in, like, you know, one's at one level and one's, like, a couple levels down, then you're like, okay, we pretty much know where this is going to go, but that thing's going to put up a fight. Then there's this uncanny valley where there's this comical level where like this big thing versus this little thing and the little thing thinks it might have a chance, but it totally doesn't have a chance. Like there's this comical level and then it just reverts back to like this thing. Everything is food to it. You know what I mean? Right. So like somewhere I feel like poodle versus moose it is, <laughs> is the comical awesome. level. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like where I see that the most has to be geese. With the like the uncanny valley of, of a, an animal that thinks it can take everything, but then really can't, it's geese. They will challenge everything to a fight, and I've seen them like intimidate things that are much larger than them and kind of win the fight in that in that regard. I've seen them chase away like like gorillas uh, and giraffes even at like a zoo. <laughs> they are just so mean. But, like, if anything ever decides to stand up to them, they just completely get flattened because they, they're a bird. They're made of feathers and hollow bones. They don't have anything. Would you say that's, like, the goose's trick is, is, the, is just the display? And to defeat the goose, you just ignore the display? I think so. I think they're very good at making a big show of themselves. Um, but 
if you can if you can get past that, I mean, you land one or two good hits, then they're they're done. Yeah, I yeah. think so. That's a pretty fragile animal. I think I think my dog would make short work of a goose if it had the courage to stand well, up to it. Well, I think the goose's strategy is to, the ability to flee. Like it can fly a really long way, and so it's in its best interest just to flee. And it's just stupid to to not play to its strengths. It takes a while for a, a goose to actually get off the ground. They have to kind of run a bit and then and then get, take off. At least the geese that I've seen. It takes them a minute to actually get airborne. Yeah, I can picture that now that you mention it. So I don't know if they can really rely on, on taking off to escape a pinch. Maybe they can. There's one thing I want to ask you about, Patrick, and it, it's about, and, and, and I'm going to have to go here in a second, but I want to ask you about sloths pooping. What's what's I learned from one of your videos that they go to the ground to poop. Exactly. They they will climb down from the tree to poop. And I'm not 100% sure why they do it, but allegedly this is where most sloths get killed. And so it seems like a terrible strategy. I'm not really sure what they're doing with that. It's such a violation. Why do you think they that do is that? A precious time. I tried to find an answer and I I just couldn't. I'm I think I saw a few things online saying maybe that pooping from high up would like give away their position like where they're or like what tree they're in um because hmm. they like they'll come down and bury but their like hunching down on the ground also give away your position exactly and so i don't know it doesn't seem like a good strategy to me i wish i had a better answer for you but i really just don't know why they do it every time i think about sloths pooping i think about you patrick i just wanted you to know that <laughs> thank you i'm honored <laughs> I, I like to view all these things as like differential equations that are constantly balancing each other so t to me, the world seems to be ruled by math. And so um, it's if you see, well, if I have too much of this, then I'm not going to have enough supply to do that. Therefore, it's going to slowly balance out as the differential equations solve each other. And so that's the kind of thing I see going on at a macro level. And what I like about your channel is, like you talked about this, I forget what you called it. It was this burst of of uh, conifers at some point in time. Uh, I forget the yeah. particular. So this is the, yeah. uh, the Carboniferous period in geologic history. Exactly. That fascinated me where you have these gigantic insects. And, you know, I, I listened to a talk one time by Don Pettit where he talked about, uh, you know, what the air pressure probably was at the time of the Quetzalcoatl was flying around. It's just fascinating stuff to think about. If you change one variable, then it changes everything else about the, the game. Right. Quetzalcoatl, that's the uh, giant pterosaur, right? Yes, sir. Anyway, I like what you do. Thank you for doing it, man. It makes me think really interesting thoughts. Thanks so much. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Okay, you referenced Smash Brothers, and uh, you referenced Mario being OP. I guess I don't play enough to understand that. I wouldn't have guessed you were going to say Mario, but who's your go-to? Ah, so right now I actually just played in a tournament, like right before jumping on this call. Uh, I was playing in, um, what? Uh, there's this guy on YouTube, his username is Critical, or Penguin Zero, uh, and he's running an online Smash tournament right now. Uh, I just played, um, my two go-tos right now are Pit, the angel, and Piranha Plant, the Venus flytrap thing. <laughs> That's like a DLC character, right? You got to pay for that one? He was free if you bought the game within the first... Or no, I think it was free if you bought the Challenger Pass. Something like that. But yeah, he, he didn't come with the game, but there was a way to get him for free. Have you ever played Smash Brothers, Destin? Yeah, like once or twice. It, it was just sensory overload for me. <laughs> it was just... Just, <laughs> just, just imagine my, my, uh, my brain... And like I try to track so many things at one time and then just put Super Smash Brothers in front of it because I want to track everything that's happening to an incredible level of detail, and it's just very difficult. Yeah, it's pretty tough to get into in that regard. My son really likes it, and we play a lot, and he's Ridley. And he just has one or two obnoxious combos <laughs> where if somebody else is keeping you busy, you're going to get that stupid Ridley smash and slide combo like three times before you can break it and get on to the next thing. Oh, yeah. Damn, it's just maddening. And he's nine, and I don't want to be irritated with him over a game. <laughs> but there's this thing that just stirs up. and I'm like, quit doing the stupid thing. It's so predictable. Well, then block it, Dad. Oh, oh, <laughs> no, you didn't. You can't block the, the sliding thing. So if he's, if he's telling you to block the, you're talking about the thing where he grabs you and drags you across the stage? Yeah, that's exactly you can't, it. You can't block that. So if he's telling you to block that, he's, he's messing with you. <laughs> 
you got to jump over it. Of course he's messing with me. Your son's OP. It is. There you go. <laughs> he's going to eclipse me here in a year or two, and I'm, I'm not emotionally prepared for that. My, <laughs> um, my go-to solution for his shenanigans would be uh, Simon and um, Dark Samus. Okay. They seem to get it done well against all of his shenanigans. You, you got to level up, man. You can't let him take you over. I clearly have some work to do. Is Smash Brothers the greatest uh, fighting game of all time? I think so. That's amazing. You That's think a so? statement right there. <laughs> I'm not prepared to posit an argument. There are some people who wouldn't even say it's a fighting game. Mechanics. Well, what is it then? Yeah, I don't know. It, I would say it's a fighting game. Some people would say, oh, you can't really say that. It's a platform fighter. It's a party game. But I think it's great. I was going to go with Rock'em Sock'em Robots myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be the right answer. <laughs> Hey, Patrick, real quick, um, on the way out the door, which videos of yours do you think uh, people would, would most enjoy? For me, I like the uh, the top five worst animal designs. I like that one. And I also like the one about the, the forest that you talk about. Those are my two favorites. Nice. Um, I think the two that I'm most proud of recently are, there's one about um, Mosasaurus. I think the title is How Mosasaurus Broke the Game. It's about this giant super predator from... Uh, the Time of the Dinosaurs. I had a lot of fun with that one. I think that one and... Actually, the one I did about iguanas. Uh, our iguanas OP. The one that I did in January. It's excellent. That one I would I would definitely recommend. I actually made that video because uh, I was in Mexico a month ago and I got bitten by an iguana. And so I decided to make a video about iguanas because I was like, oh, maybe I'm underestimating these things. <laughs> underestimating. And that brings us full circle to how big an animal could you take? Yeah, apparently not so, an iguana, so yeah, <laughs> maybe a deer. I'm biting off more than I can chew already. <laughs> it's not. When it happened, did you hear a little health bar drop sound? Like, pew! <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I was certainly imagining it in my head. The little runescape hit splat. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> That's awesome. Dude, thanks for hopping on, man. Hey. This is a blast. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun, buddy, I, and thanks for indulging me on the uh, gaming side just a little bit. I always enjoy kicking that around with you. I'm always down to talk games. Okay, well, there will be more. <laughs> hey, Destin, I know you got to get cooking, so I'm going to let you guys both go. Thanks for hanging out. Yeah, rock and roll. Thanks for being here, Patrick. We, we appreciate Have it. Have a good night. I'll check in soon, man. I do want to talk more Smash because you need to help me defeat me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I can give you some pointers. <laughs> Ridley's not, Ridley's not too bad. <laughs> okay, Sweet. I'll check in, man. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too.